Everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. For this one, talking about the AMD lack of recommendation for using Windows 10 Enterprise for the 3990X. Some of you saw that story go out previously, and AMD has commented on it now. Fantax and its blatant ripoff of another uh, computer hardware, another case from a competitor. The NES PlayStation up for auction. Talked about that a few weeks ago, but it is back. Google Cloud getting more Epic CPUs. Asus blaming AMD for mounting pressure issues and a couple of other items like Samsung bringing dedicated EUV fabs online for 7 nanometer and for 6 nanometer. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So for the first one, an update on this shirt design. We announced this shirt in our Fractal Defined 7 case review. We expected maybe 30 of them or so to sell from the announcement in that video, but all 200 of the initial order were gone within uh, about 12 hours. All of them were just completely sold out. So the shirt was designed with 100% of the profit going to Adelaide Koala and Wildlife Hospital in Australia, and we're going to open up some back orders for these because a lot of people, specifically in Australia, couldn't get one because they went live when Australia was asleep. So that was, a, <laughs> that was not an expected issue, but happy to see it's so popular though. The shirt is uh, helping out Adelaide Koala and Wildlife Hospital. They are dedicated to rehabilitation and rescue of animals in the area. Koalas aren't the only animals they rescue. We were worried about ending up stuck with overstock on this shirt and never expected the design to be our fastest selling design ever. It's got a motherboard, RAM, GPU, CPU, power supplies, and other components on the front banding together around an Australia outline. And the back of the shirt has a limited run of the Gamers Nexus logo with a koala and some eucalyptus plants on it. It sold out so fast when we launched it in that case video that our Australian viewers were asleep when it was launched, and I got a lot of messages from people saying that they never even got a chance to order it. So since this benefits charity, I don't think any of the initial purchasers will be upset that the design has become marginally less limited by us opening up some back orders on it. Uh, and we're going to open these up for back orders, so they'll be online through midday Monday. So that'll give everyone a chance to put an order in through about 12 p.m. EST Monday. And if you ordered on Thursday, which is when the shirt went live, uh, our time at least, your shirt's ready to go out and it's it can be shipped already because we had those in stock. Anyone ordering while it's on back order will have their entire order, including any in stock items now held uh, until about March 6th, which is when we expect these to come in for the back orders. So we're going to order based on the amount of back orders we get. That way we don't over or under order this time. And uh, so you won't get split between two different packages because I don't profit on the shirt. It's going to Adelaide Koala and Wildlife hospital, so we can't split the orders because then, I mean, it's just, I'd spend a lot of money on shipping because we'd have to ship stuff twice and you only pay once. So uh, we'll hold the orders if you place one with multiple items. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's up on store.gamersnexus.net if you want to place a back order for it. And uh, I mean, it's cool to see so much interest in the design and obviously interest in supporting the uh, wildlife hospital that we've chosen to support with these efforts. So next up, GN factory tour scheduling before I get into some of the other news items. As a reminder from last week's episode, we'll be in Taiwan for another factory tour series from, it's, it's going to be for a couple of weeks in early March. And we wanted to give you a heads up on what's coming so that you can plan to check out the videos when we start posting them. The cost for these trips balloons incredibly high with all the travel, so we, we're just trying to make sure everyone's got it on the calendar to come check them out. So videos, so far we have a challenge of sorts planned in local tech markets between me and Patrick, so we'll be doing some kind of head-to-head. -head. We're not exactly sure what we're shopping for yet, but that'll be fun. We've got some interesting challenges there. I'll probably pair Andrew up with Patrick so that uh, Patrick has someone who speaks a bit of Chinese on the team, and then I'll go out with Keegan and we'll try to buy whatever it is we're buying and see who ends up getting the best thing. So that'll be one of the things we're doing. We're also going to be visiting a power supply factory that's booked. We have an aluminum extrusion factory, an electric chisel factory, uh, both of which work with case manufacturers. And we've seen those before, but we'll visit another case factory as well. And we're working on touring an open loop cooling parts manufacturer. If we can get that booked, that'd be a first for us. 
And then we also have some plans to visit the XOC Labs. So make sure to check back for all that around probably March, maybe 8th, 9th, somewhere there is when we'll start posting videos from that. First news item then from actual hardware news, and these Threader for 3990X came with more than a few interesting surprises. One of them was apparently discovered by Anantech in uh, reviewing the Threader for 3990X. Anantech found that, at least in their testing environment, the 64 core 128 thread chip performed uh, allegedly stronger on Windows 10 Enterprise than it did in Windows 10 Pro. The sister site of Anantech, Tom's Hardware, both owned by the same parent company, decided to do some investigative work and stated the following, quote, we've spent some time retesting our Threader for 3990X with a direct update from Windows 10 Pro to the Enterprise version and noticed little to no performance improvement outside of the expected standard deviation we experienced with our benchmarks. And that was by Paul Alcorn at Tom's. Tom's also reached out to AMD and received the following statement from AMD to Tom's Hardware. It says, AMD officially recommends Windows 10 Professional or Linux for the AMD Ryzen Threader for 3990X. Higher editions or versions of Windows 10 confer no additional performance or compatibility benefits to the processor. We understand that this suggestion has been made in the media, but we believe this to be an error in testing that our team is presently diagnosing. Anantech, for its part, stands by its testing and also states that Foronix, the uh, famous Linux testing site, has verified its findings as well. It seems that one current theory for this is that the supposed performance uplift in the 3990X is an advantage in which Windows Scheduler addresses the cores and threads differently between the two. Windows 10 Pro groups the first 64 threads into one group, apparently, and anything beyond that into another group. And these are uh, known as NUMA nodes, and the way in which Windows and the Windows Scheduler optimizes the nodes can vary between versions. So that's the current going theory for why the results might be different, although AMD is disputing that. Uh, Windows 10 Pro supports 128 threads, while Windows 10 Enterprise supports 256. It seems that the workstation and enterprise versions of Windows 10 may simply be better suited to or have NUMA-specific enhancements for handling extremely high core count chips. We don't have any testing between these Windows versions right now, so we, we couldn't really tell you, but we'll keep an eye on what Tom's Anantech and AMD end up posting following up on this. Next up, Fantax and its blatant ripoff of the O11 Dynamic. Fantax has a long and storied history involving uh, NZXT that one day will tell. But for now, it seems that Fantax has set its sights on Lian Li instead. Under its sub-brand Metallic Gear, which we've reported on a couple of years now at various trade shows, Metallic Gear is always in the Fantax suite and is owned by Fantax. Uh, under its sub-brand Metallic Gear, which apparently was created because Fantax didn't want to dirty its main brand with things that are obviously knockoffs and look like something you'd find in a Shanghai knockoff marketplace or something. The O11 ripoff is its newest case. So this is, it's disappointing to see. It's at, at least Antec, when Antec made the P120 Crystal, which kind of looked like the O11 Dynamic externally, at least Antec had some differences internally, like for example, the rear fan mount difference or the fact that it's not a dual chamber design, the power supply is on the top. There's some differences there. The price is a bit lower too and can account for some of the downsides of the case. But at least Antec overall m tried to make some changes or was forced to make some changes because maybe it couldn't afford the tooling. Either way though, the P120 for looking like the Lian Leo 11 Dynamic was actually a different case. So far, the Metallic Gear Neo Cube, it's called, looks like a direct design copy of the O11 series. We know that there's only so many ways to make a case, but typically when case manufacturers take ideas from each other and improve upon them, they don't take all of the ideas from one case and put it into a new case and then, make, and then leave it all the same, because that's just copying. So there's plenty of things that could be done without copying a case part for part. They've got the same side bottom intake setup. They have the same top and rear intake setup for the most part. The motherboard tray is about the same. The dual chamber design is still there. Some differences there with probably the power supply support that we can talk about uh, when we get the case. We'll probably be buying this one, I have a feeling. And uh, it, the front of it is, I mean, it's 100% a ripoff. There is no doubt in anyone's mind that the look of the case externally is absolutely inspired by stealing the design idea from Lian Lee. So really disappointed to see that from Fantax because the company had sort of a questionable start and it treated media poorly when criticized. Uh, it did not respond well to our criticism over the years. But 
Then it rectified much of its image by releasing some actually good products, like the P400A, for example, and showing that it can listen to criticism and can improve and make good products and not just be sore about it and block media access. So they've really, in our books, Fantex has elevated itself a lot in recent years. And uh, it used to be the case we'd go to their suite and the first thing they'd ask us about is, what's NZXT doing, even though we're potentially under embargoes or NDAs for that, which was always just a bit weird and was kind of like, well, we came here to see Fantex, not NZXT, so let's see your stuff. So now it's taking a turn back towards this really just disappointing side of things. Uh, you know, Fantex, you've proven capable case designers commit to that and make something new and better than the O11 Dynamic because based on your other designs, that's a possibility. So why direct copy it? Anyway, the, that's going to be Metallic Gear's Neo Cube. We'll buy it and look at it because there's no way they're sending us that. Next one, NES PlayStation up for auction. Last December, we mentioned that the sole remaining prototype for the NES PlayStation was, and that's an actual thing, NES PlayStation was the name of it, was to be auctioned off this March. However, it seems that Heritage Auctions decided to kick things off a bit early as the auction's already gone live. So if you are extremely individually wealthy, uh, you'll have an option through March 6th or 7th to buy this thing. The current bid at the time of writing is $300,000. And the owner, uh, Terry Diebold, has reportedly already turned down at least a $1.2 million offer for the prototype console that uh, bears the naming NES PlayStation. The auction has only been accepting bids for a handful of days. With 14 days left to go, it may yet exceed that rumored $1.2 million figure, and we'll follow up on it once it sells. But if you're into weird collectible limited prototype run consoles and also have millions of dollars in cash, then uh, it might be worth checking out. Next one, Google Cloud gets more AMD Epic. Epic has been something of a slow burn, but AMD continues to notch victories where it counts. If AMD intends to make good on its commitment for double-digit server share this year, getting major cloud deployers like Google to increase their Epic-based instances in the cloud is a good way to do it. While neither AMD nor Google officially disclosed what SKUs are being used for the new VMs, we know that they are based on AMD's second-gen Epic Rome CPUs. Per AMD's press release, the new N2D offers up to 128 and 224 vCPUs aimed at both general-purpose workloads and high-performance workloads. In a statement by AMD's Forrest Norad, it seems to be suggested that Google's Epic adoption will continue into the future. Quote, AMD and Google have worked together closely on these initial VMs to help ensure Google Cloud customers have a high-performance and cost-effective experience across a variety of workloads. And we will continue to work together to provide that experience this year and beyond. The next one is about AMD GPU mounting pressure issues. We talked about this months and months ago when the 5700XT came out and we did the, the washer mod for the 5700XT reference card, I think it was. And we saw improvement. We've been talking about it with the MSI Evoke cards as well when they had mounting pressure issues. But that's continued. And now it's continued in a more public way than just in the media and user base because Asus is blaming AMD for giving it a, I guess, a, a, some misguidance on how tight the GPU cooler should be mounted to the card itself. So it seems that, according to ASUS, the culprit for its 5700XT Strix temperatures is a poorly tightened backplate. It says, quote, initial batches of ROG RX 5700 series graphics cards were torqued to 30 to 40 PSI based on AMD's baseline recommendations. While those guidelines provided leeway to apply more torque, we took a cautious approach because we were dealing with a new 7 nanometer GPU and didn't want to risk damage to the die. After receiving user reports regarding temperature issues, we performed extended R&D testing to find the optimal PSI range for our graphics cards without compromising GPU reliability. Uh, per PC world for this one, Asus went on to say that it found the optimal torque range for the backplate screws at 50 to 70 PSI and said that future cards will ship with the new screws torqued to 50 to 60 PSI. Asus is also telling customers to get in touch with the company to receive an upgrade for free starting next month. Uh, users who were experiencing or reporting that tightening the screws or adding washers seemed to crack the issue were on the right track. I, we saw that too. It wasn't just Asus affected though. MSI and the reference cards were also affected. So here's hoping that at least on the Asus side they fixed the problem. But uh, either way, we wouldn't be surprised if AMD did provide 
an erroneous spec because that certainly happened before. But we also wouldn't be surprised if Asus just made a really bad choice with how it's doing its coolers because that has also happened a lot before. Next one, Samsung brings dedicated EUV fabs online for seven nanometer and six nanometer production. Samsung has announced its first line of dedicated EUV production, newly minted as the V1 line at the facility of uh, in Huaxian, Korea. Samsung broke ground for the new fab back in February of 2018 with initial wafer testing starting in second half of 2019. The first products out of the fab will be delivered to customers during first quarter 2020. Samsung also notes that the total investment in the V1 fab will be $6 billion by the end of 2020. And it also continues to execute on its plan of addressing the seven nanometer and other shrinking nodes. The V1 line is currently producing chips based on Samsung's 7 LPP and 6 LPP technology, and Samsung expects the line will be scaled to produce as small as 3 nanometer chips. With the new V1 line, Samsung's 7 nanometer EV capacity is expected to triple what it had in 2019. For the last one, there are a lot of unsung computing heroes out there. Chuck Pedal was one we spoke about probably a couple months ago in a news video, and in a world where the unimaginably wealthy and large tech giants get most of the credit, we like to point out some of the lesser known or at least less commonly known names of engineers and some of the scientists who have paved the way for what we have today. In this one, Larry Tesler is one such computer scientist that many likely aren't familiar with. However, anyone who's used a computer in the last 20 years will be familiar with his work. Larry Tesler is known for breeding the world cut, copy, and paste, among other things. Cut, copy, paste was born out of Tesler's desire for simpler editing with a keyboard and mouse, something that wasn't prevalent in the 1970s. Tesla was also a proponent of what was known as modeless computing, meaning that software or a user interface is always in an editable mode. Users aren't required to enter a command, like certain key presses or combinations, to enter editing mode. Tesla built cut, copy, paste functionality into one of the world's first word processors, and that was Gypsy, while working at Xerox Park. Tesla's work also extends to Apple, where he's credited with introducing the company to the idea of GUIs with the Apple Lisa. He's also credited with helping Amazon and Yahoo with overhauling their UIs. Tesla was also an early believer in the ARM platform, as he managed to convince Apple to invest in the company long before Apple would put the chips in its iPhones. Motherboard put it well when describing Tesla and said, quote, perhaps Larry Tesla, whose last big Silicon Valley job was at the DNA testing firm 23andMe in the late 2000s, never became as big of a deal as Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, or Larry Page. But he was often in the same rooms as all of those guys, and he played just as important a role in modern technology as any of those figures." End quote. So Tesla passed away recently at the age of 74, but obviously his work will live on because cut, copy, paste was, uh, you might not really think it today in daily use, but was genuinely revolutionary for the computing industry. And he's an interesting figure to read up more on if you're interested in computer history. That's it for this news. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or to help out the charity effort with this shirt. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get some behind the scenes bonus videos that we publish for our Patreon backers. We've been putting more there lately. So thanks for, uh, for watching. We'll see you all next time.